All right, good evening, everyone. Um, yesterday we had a very, very short class, like 12 slides. Today we have a little over 40. So it's it's gonna we're gonna be moving and growing today. Um, and we're gonna be covering financing and real estate. And there's actually a whole course on this that y'all will be going over, uh, real estate finance, where you'll go into it way more detail. We're just gonna skim over a lot of the information today. Um, so you'll go into more detail in finance. You'll learn more about it. Our learning objectives for the evening. <coughs> Uh, we're going to identify the basic components of a promissory note, define loan origination fee, discount points, and prepayment penalty. We'll explain a deed of trust and why lenders prefer it. Uh, we'll explain the use of a land contract or owner financing. We'll identify the two general types of foreclosure proceedings. Uh, we'll identify the types of institutions and the per. per primary and secondary mortgage markets. Uh, we'll describe the various types of financing techniques available. We'll also discuss the significance of private mortgage insurance on conventional loans. Uh, we'll compare FHA and VA government loans. And we'll examine the role of government financing regulations in the Truth in Lending, Equal Credit Opportunity, and Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act. All right, like I said, we got a lot to cover. I mean, if I if I spend over three minutes on a slide, we're not gonna we're not gonna finish. Um, so we might be moving a little quick. Just warning. Um, all right, so definitions. A mortgage. We we know what a mortgage is. It's a lien or an encumbrance. Now, when you pay your mortgage, are you actually paying your mortgage? What are you paying? Anyone here know? Promissory note. You're paying your promissory note. Uh, and there's going to be a mortgage or and a mortgagee. Remember, we said OR, you're doing EE, receiving, right? Well, for mortgages, they switched up on it. So the mortgager, you'd think, would be the one lending the money, but it's not. That, that would be the one borrowing. And the mortgagee is the lender in that situation. Uh, title theory. Uh, Mortgager gives legal title to the mortgagee and the mortgager retains equitable title. Legal title returned to the mortgager uh, when the debt is paid. Um, so the mortgager gives legal title to the mortgagee and the mortgager retains equitable title, which means they still have equity, they have equitable, equitable title. Um, and the legal title will be returned to the mortgager when the debt is paid. A lien theory. We're actually, a, we're a title theory state here, aren't we? Where is it? Okay, so Texas is a title theory state. Uh, the next one is lien theory. Uh, the we, have a, we have a mixture. Uh, we have a mixture. We have a part of it. It depends on... Basically, if you want to use it for testing purposes, you're going to use lien. Okay? For testing purposes, it's going to be lien. Title is going to be kind of the other states around us. But just for testing purposes, just remember lien theory. And a lien theory is mortgager retains legal and equitable title, uh, but the mortgagee has a lien on the property as security for the mortgage debt. Texas is a lien theory state, so there it is there. Um, so a mortgage is a debt, uh, but the, mor the mortgager is going to retain that title and they're going to hold on to it until the debt is paid and then they will receive the release of the lien or the deed. Um, there's also a modified lien theory. The title remains with the borrower, but the lender may take back title to the property if the borrower defaults on the loan. So you don't make your payments, you're in default. Uh, the property is going to revert back to the bar, uh, to the uh, lender or the mortgager to the lender. I switched it around on those. I switched it around on this mortgager is going to be the buyer. So it's going to go back to the mortgagee, not the mortgager.
promissory note. Like I said, yeah, when you're paying your debt, you're paying a promissory note. Um, the definition of a promissory note, also called a note or a financing instrument, is the borrower's personal promise to repay the debt according to the agreed terms. It's basically, it's, it's just basically the, uh, the mortgage. We promise to pay you if we get the, you know, if we get the house. And if we don't pay you, there's all kinds of clauses and stuff. We'll go into that a little bit later, but um, if you don't pay, they can take it back. Um, and these are some elements that are going to be in a promissory note. Um, the amount of the debt, the time, the method of payment, and the interest. Now, interest is a charge for the use of money. Um, so, and there's also a usury law for the uh, max interest you can pay. Because uh, we didn't have the usury law, which charges interest in excess of the maximum set by the law. So, so if they, uh, Uh, so if we didn't have this law, people could charge whatever they wanted interest. You could be, they could charge 100% interest and you'd be paying it for the rest of your life. So we have this usury law that keeps lenders from doing something like that. Uh, there's a certain amount that each state has. You can't go above it. So what's Texas? What is Texas? It's a state. What's our maximum? Oh, our maximum? Uh, isn't it like... Is it 9.99? 9.99. Multiply 9 by 2. Oh, really? It's 18? Mm -hmm. I thought that was only a Pittsburgh. Seriously? It's 18? About 18%. Good God. That's it's a lot. 18%. Of, that's without a lot of violating money. usury. Credit cards. Some credit cards can go up to 24. Yeah. yeah. If someone offers you 18% interest, I would not take it. <laughs> just, just saying that. That's, that's going to be a lot of money. I'll be more than happy to finance y'all. Uh, I, my interest was 18%. Like so. <laughs> Why it needs to cross the money? Yeah, 18%. Like spending stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and we talked about this in a, a earlier in a different class. Um, if you want to write down P I T I, P T or P I T I vertical, and remember that's principal, interest, taxes, and insurance. Uh, yeah, so interest is the charge to use money. It's basically saying we're loaning you money. We need to make money too. Everybody's got to make money. So we're going to charge you for loaning you said money. Uh, some more elements. There's going to be a loan origination fee. Sometimes there's a fee that you'll have to pay uh, just for them to even write up a loan. Uh, Justin told me once it could go up to a couple thousand, could not it? Which one? Loan origination. Loan origination. It's only one percent of the uh, total purchase. One percent of the total purchase price. So that could be. I mean, you buy a two hundred thousand dollar house, it's two grand. So uh, sometimes you will see a loan origination fee. Now, pre prepayment penalty fee. Uh, the Biden administration actually did away with that. Not Biden. Obama. Oh, Obama. So I was just reading Biden. That's all over the news. Um, Obama did away with that, but it was a clause that said, like, say, I, I owe a bunch of money uh, for my uh, for my lien. Let's say, uh, um, so let's say you want to pay your your uh, loan off early. You work hard, you make a bunch of money, you want to pay that off, so you go and you pay it off. Well, there's sometimes there could be a prepayment penalty where it's say, oh, I paid off my loan. And they'll be like, shame on you. You paid off your loan too early. We're going to charge you said amount. So, I mean, you would think you would want to pay your debt off early, right? Well, and if you have a prepayment penalty, you're going to want to not do that. And if uh, you have a client that says, I want to pay off my loan, uh, I would I would say check with your check with your deed check check with your contract and see if you have a prepayment penalty because if you do I wouldn't pay it. Would that be the same case 
property? If you were to sell a property, there's a prepayment penalty? Uh, it's mostly the buyer, is that correct, Justin? Because wouldn't it go to a different lender in that situation? So here's what ends up happening. Prepayment penalty comes down to this, okay? Imagine this, Wyatt, you go to school, okay? You you go into school, it's either your case professor, okay? So you go to school, and first day, Ms. Beaton says, here's all the homework assignments and exams and everything that you're going to do in my class, okay? Wyatt is a go-getter. He goes home over the weekend. He has no life. He just does all his homework and exams. He comes back, he gives them to you. This media gets it, and you're thinking, Wyatt, what? I finished all my stuff I'm this done. weekend. I'm done. Hallelujah. I can party the rest of the semester. Yeah. Miss Vita gets it, and she puts F and hands it back to you. How do you feel about that? You don't like that at all, right? Same thing with prepayment. Yeah, basically the same thing. So Miss money. Miss Miss Vita <laughs> gave you a hundred thousand dollars to buy your house. Yeah. You hit the lottery, made a million dollars. You go pay Miss Vita a hundred thousand dollars. And you're right back in a month. She's gonna kick back and say, You owe me this percentage back. And maybe twenty five thousand, maybe fifty thousand dollars that you still owe Miss Vita. Even though you paid her her hundred thousand. Why is that though, Miss Vita? Why are you charging me? Because you were promising to pay a certain amount of interest, and you're not going to because it's a short amount of time. Exactly. So if you pay her right back in 30 days, she got very little interest. If she's a bank, she might have lent to Miss McKenna here maybe a hundred thousand dollar loan too. And guess what? She's going to be able to fund hers through the interest payments that you were going to pay her. But now that you paid her off, she don't have the interest payment, so now she can't fund Miss McKenna's loan. Yeah. Maybe you're not yep. That's a prepayment penalty, and it was done away with, so newer contracts you won't but see you it. Lottery, so you're in the yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you see kind of how that works. Yeah. Now, if you are selling, going back to the speed of this question, if you're selling a property and they pay it off, different story. Because the fact is, is it's transferring back to bank. It's not being paid off full. Sometimes there's also a fee that's put on top of these loans. That's why you pay a little bit more. So it kind of they give you a payoff amount. That payoff amount sometimes includes some interest. So you get a payoff, so they're not too much of a big deal. But it's if somebody came out of pocket and wrote a check, that's where they're going to get you a prepayment. Does that make sense? So if you just happen to make a ton of money one day, you make it hit with prepayments. Yeah, real estate, you five million dollar transaction. Yeah. Well, and let me tell you this: one of the key things I tell a lot of people is, with prepayment penalty, you're not going to see it after about 2008 is when it kind of stopped because of Obama's administration. But you still will see them because there are still people that are in 30 year notes. Right. So if you think about it, if it was in the 80s, they still may possibly be out there. So if you have a loan that was from 1980, they still may, still may be paying and they may come to you and say, Ms. Vita, should I pay off my note? Well, in that situation, you'll want to look at the prepayment penalty to see if it's in the, the contract. Because if it is, then you need to end up telling your client, don't you dare pay it off. Don't pay it off. Pay it off as it is or sell it or reach into the problem. That right. makes sense. Like you so said, it was be still... very careful with that situation. And that, that you can do too. Yes, you can. So very good in those, but you just need to be aware of them. Because you'll sometimes, I get clients that come in and they'll inherit money. And they're like, well, I inherited $50,000. I'm going to go pay $50,000 on my deal. Uh-uh. Because you may get hit with a prepayment or other penalty or fee or something. Don't do it. Keep that money and put it somewhere else. So would the prepayment penalty be more than the interest portion? No, never will be more, but it will only be, so they'll take the total interest and they'll take a percentage of that total interest and that's what you've got to end up paying. Okay. Which makes sense. Yeah. Well, like never said, can it be more, it'll just be a percentage of it. Yeah. Uh, like you said, it's it's pretty much done away with, but people that have, you know, 30 year, 30 year mortgages, you may see it. So if you get a client that says I want to pay it off, just check just check the contract, make sure they don't have a prepayment penalty. All right, mortgages or deeds of trust. Uh, we'll go into it a little bit. I think we go into a little more detail later. 
Um, but these are the basics. Uh, mortgage, this is actually not used in Texas. In Texas, we are a deed of trust state. We don't use the mortgage. Uh, but there's two parties in a mortgage. There's going to be the borrower, the mortgage or, and the mortgagee, the lender. Uh, in a deed of trust, however, there's three parties. Um, the trustor, the trustee, and the beneficiary. Uh, so we know who the trustor and the, tr and the beneficiary are, but who's the trustee? Okay. Um, normally the trustee is going to be a third party individual that has nothing to do with the contract. Uh, let's say the lenders, say the lenders attorney, as, as long as they both agree on it, uh, both parties agree on it. What? They don't have to agree. And the beneficiary will always designate who the trustee is going to be in the deed of trust. Oh. Especially in divorces. Mm -hmm. Lender will always choose who the trustee is going to be. Okay. So, so the fact is, they don't want you ending up saying, uh, I don't want your attorney, they, so they get first gifts. Right. Um, so it's just going to be a, a, a neutral third party that doesn't have anything to do with the transaction. Um, but a deed of trust, it basically says in Texas, um, you will pay this amount for the, you know, you'll pay for your mortgage. If you do not, then the lend, if you do not pay, the lender is going to take back a position of the property. So, uh, so let's say I don't pay for one month and then the lender says, well, where's my payment? And they give you another month and just next month. Where's my payment? I still haven't got my payment. Oh, it's in the mail. It's in the mail. It'll get there. Third month comes by. Still haven't got a payment. At that point, after three months, um, he'll do what's called an acceleration clause. And I think we go into that you know, in a few slides. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll move on and go into that. Um, do these are real, real quick. quick. Go back for a minute, please. Who goes in or for life? What's or is Texas a mortgage state or a deed of trust state? Deed of trust. Exactly. So in that situation, why do we do a deed of trust? We talked about this when I talked on Friday. Why exactly do we do a deed of trust? Y'all weren't here Friday. Did you listen to the recording? No, they did. For shame. For shame. Miss Nita, do you remember why uh, we're not a deed of trust? Probably why we're not a mortgage state. Um. So mortgage state, it takes a very long time to foreclose. So you say I want to get you out of my house. Mortgage will last sometimes up to two years before I can get you out of my house. In a deed of trust, I can have you out in about a few months. So that's one of the key things you know. In a mortgage state, I can actually end up, it's going to take forever because i got to do what's called judicial foreclosure. In a deed of trust, you might write this down, it's, it's a non-judicial foreclosure. Meaning that I can go down to the courthouse, file some paperwork, do my stuff, and wham, bam, I'm done. I got, I got the paperwork, and I can get you out. So I don't have to have a hearing and all of this stuff. I can kind of get you in and get you out pretty quick in a year of trust. So it's a lot quicker. That makes sense. Which, you know, lenders and property owners are going to be ecstatic, but, right? They can get you out quicker if they need to. Mm -hmm. uh, the duties of the mortgagor or the truster. Um, payment of the debt, of, of course, you're, you're going to have to pay off your debt in accordance with the terms of the note. Um, payment of all real estate taxes on the property, given as security. So uh, that's part of the PITI we were talking about. Um, and maintenance of adequate insurance to protect a lender if the property is destroyed or damaged by fire. Um, so basically all the property owners will fall on the trust floor. Right. Even though the trust is supposed to see the property for their house. There's not. Well, the trustee is because I thought they were. I thought they were the ones that took over the, the note, the the payment to receive the deed. Correct. Right. Um I don't know, Justin, I'm going to need help on that one. Say, say that again, I'm sorry. So. I, okay, so the trust uh, store huh? is the one that assumes all the responsibilities for the note. 
but I thought that it was supposed to be the other way around. It's supposed to be the trustee because they're the ones that are going to receive the deed when it's all done. No, 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 no. The beneficiary is going to be the one. So, so don't let it. So here's the thing. What you're thinking is from a legal perspective. Bag up. This is a financial perspective. Remember, a deed of trust is a finance document, not a legal document, which it is a legal document, but it's a finance document. So the question you have to ask yourself, the one up there, the beneficiary is the one that if payment's not received, they want to get the property back, the collateral. You see what I'm saying? So the trustor is going ahead in the deed of trust and is waiving. So they're basically, when you sit down and sign your document, you're doing a deed of trust, at the closing, when they're buying the property, the buyer is going to sign the deed of trust that's transferring ownership to the lender. However, the lender never gets that deed. The trustee holds that deed in the event that the trustor defaults. Do you see what I'm saying? So the beneficiary would be the one that if the trustor, the, ben the borrower, defaults, then trustee will give deed back over to the lender so the lender can close. Okay, you see kind of where I'm going with that. Yeah. So if, like you, if, I, if I was giving you, if I was paying you with a check, mm -hmm. so I have money in my account, mm -hmm. I write a check, mm -hmm. I hand it to Wyatt to give to you mm -hmm. in the case that something, Does I don't do something or whatever. But until right. you get that, I still hold the power, yep. I still have the money in my account, it's still my, mm -hmm. it's under my name, but right. if I default on the loan or whatever, and he gives you that check, that's when it becomes it's not mine. But yeah. It's just he Wyatt is in that hypothetical. Why is a holding man? Yeah. Basically. He's holding on to the deal and if he defaults, I get the money. The same concept here yeah. is Wyatt would be holding title, the deed, that says Travis is transferring ownership back to me, even though I'm I don't need that because Travis is paying me. So long as Travis is paying me, I don't need that. But the minute Travis stops paying me, I want that access to get it back. Now, from a legal perspective, because that's kind of your background right there, is it's kind of flipped. Exactly. You see what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. Because I had that. I had that when I worked in a law firm myself years ago. When I first learned this, I was like this, and I was like, "That doesn't make sense." But then they explained to me it's a financing in instrument, and that's why it is flipped around this way. Because what you're saying is completely correct from a legal term of a normal trust. From a deed of trust, it's a financing instrument, completely different, completely different way of how it works. Yeah. So yes, that will probably bug you to death because it still bugs me to death. It's just it's because of how you learn. But you're used to it this way. This is just, of course, backwards. But you're on the same thought process. You just gotta look. Very good question. Yeah. She got it. She knows what she's got there. She got it. Um, yeah, and maintenance and adequate insurance to protect the lender. You need insurance to protect the lender. It's not really to protect the, the owner or the lender. It's to protect the lender in case the default or it gets destroyed. Um, maintenance of the property in good repair at all times. That is one that people tend to fail at, I guess you could say. Um, but that is one of your duties. It could even be subject to termination. If you if you let it get too bad, eventually uh, the lender might say, you know, we're kicking you out. Just leave it. For example, if you're not keeping up with the rooms, you can tell they're damaged. Right. And they have somebody just drive by the house and they don't some kind of inspector. And it looks like the roof is falling off in one part and they look by you and you don't get it fixed. That would be cause termination, right? What did she just say? You weren't paying attention? I don't know. A drive by. What do you do, Mr. Travis, on the side to make some money? Oh, he can take you. Ah, that's what she just told you. Yes, there will be sometimes an agent will pull by, which we do sometimes off and on to make quick money. We'll drive by, and if the property's not in good maintenance, we'll report it to the bank, and the bank will then notify that owner and say, hey, we see a hole in your roof. We see this. You need to fix it. So that is some side money that we make 
off and on. You make 50 to 150 bucks depending on where it's at. Yeah. So we do that a lot. And you're basically so, just doing a report on a foreclosing house or a house that's about to be foreclosed on. Yeah, the best ones Travis loves are the ones where you drive about 45 minutes to an hour away, and then after you've done the work, they take oh, this they is fun. I've had that happen once. Yeah. <laughs> they, 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 after you do all the work, then they cancel it. I had, and say, I had that happen to me, too. Yeah. I, I finished had, it, and it's like, oh, it's been canceled. I had one in Brown, and I had two in. Once it was two in. The Waller a Tomball area. I drove down a bunch of I drove down to about like three hours doing a loop, taking all these photos, whatever. Got back to the office when I got to the office, opened my phone, and 20 minutes before I opened my phone, I got an email saying they're looking for no great value. And I was like, cool. So I just emailed them back and was like, I want my money. Here's all the proof that I went down and did all this stuff. And they were like, all right, give us a call. And they paid me like $20 per thing. So they paid for gas while going over there. Yeah. Yeah, but they they gave me something for travel fee, but I got to go over but I had to drive down the hill with photos, so. Well, they cancel what? Basically, somebody, they'll somebody puts in a request that they want a VPO done. Oh, so they, okay. they get a client that says, hey, have somebody do this for me. They contact us. I go do it. And while I'm out doing it, the original client contacts them, but ah, never mind, we'll cancel it. And to them, I haven't done it yet because I haven't put in that I've done it. So they said, oh, don't worry about it. Like, we'll cancel it. No big deal. So they send me an email that's saying it's canceled, but they don't know that when they sent that to me, I'm in Waco taking photos of a house. Because <laughs> this is like something stupid. So yeah. <laughs> what happened, Travis, actually, all the money went to Wyatt's back pocket. He just didn't tell you. Makes sense. He's going to have to pay the interest on that black card. He's going to pay that black card. He's going to pay that black card. I believe it. So if you don't maintain your property, that could be grounds for a foreclosure or, or termination. Um, another duty receipt of lender authorization make you, before making any major alterations to the property. So you can't just like go and say, I want to tear down this wall and get a more open concept. You actually have to go and tell your lender what you want to do and they'll approve it or not. Um, because sometimes let's say he tears down a wall and now the four bedroom house is a three bedroom. But in that area, three bedrooms don't sell. So he just plummeted the value because he wanted to do some maintenance on it. And uh, you just you gotta get uh, you gotta get authorization for your from your lender if you're gonna do anything like that. Um, but say you pay it outright or you buy a house with cash, which is rare, but it does happen. You don't know, you don't you don't owe anybody anything, so you can do whatever you want to the house because you own it outright. But if you do have a lender involved and you want to make a change, make sure you uh, contact them. If it's going to improve the value of the house, they'll probably be okay with it. And you still want to check with your with your lender because they could that could lead to another uh, proposal of drop a drop up the loan. Uh, provisions provisions for default. Now, remember I talked a minute ago about the acceleration clause. Now, all, all, all uh, forms are going to have a provision for default. They might not have an acceleration clause, but all uh, forms are going to have a provision for a default. Um, so if included, included an acceleration clause, what do you think that does, Ms. Vita? What does an acceleration clause do? It's, okay. It accelerates a clause. Very good. You're close. Uh, that's going to accelerate the loan by a lot. So let's say you, you default, you don't pay for three months, uh, then the lender's going to send you uh, an acceleration clause. And that's going to say, you didn't pay for three months, so now you owe us the entire loan amount immediately. And you need to pay it right now. And of course, they're probably not going to pay it. So it's going to lead to a foreclosure, which is going to get the lender back to the house. Makes sense? You, you, you look like you're going to ask a question. If you sign the contract, it may already have an acceleration clause. That's why you need to look at it. Yeah, and that, read, read the hundred pages, right? The billion pages mm -hmm. that make you sign. Yeah. And they just go initial here. Sign here, sign here. Cool. They don't really give you time to read it. Yeah. If you can read it, read your contract because it might have something like that. Can you like scratch it off and say I don't want this in there? 
or would that be something like the lender? Some like lenders that? might be okay with it. Um, it depends so on how the form works, because I know like for real estate, for example, we have on our contracts, you can put them up earlier, but um, you know, there's a bunch of black text and then blanks for us to fill in. If you don't like one of the things that's in black and you want to cross it out, you have I you have to go talk to an attorney and have you reroute the form. Because this is a legally complicated form that has been approved by correct. So if you want to change that form in any way, you have to consult an attorney to have him redraft and approve a form and send it to them to have them approve and everything. Like that. You cannot change or add yeah. words into a document that's been promulgated. Yeah. So I don't know if it, I don't know if it's the same way for lenders. I'd assume there's some I, sort of I would say so. <laughs> commission that kind of underwriting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or else that's just a lot of that's a lot of stuff they have to deal with. It. But um, that's I mean I've had I've had clients before that are like cool. I don't. I don't want them to have a spot to be able to, like, I want to knock out this paragraph and I want to knock out these things here. And I'm like, then go talk to an attorney and come back. And like, I, I I'm not going to scratch it off with a Sharpie. Like, I was like, oh, you won't need oh, yeah, so, it. Yeah, it's like, so, so you have fun with that. And get back to me whenever you paid them how much money to redraft the new form. And they will use your license if you mess yeah. with the problem. Like, the form, the forms we were talking about yesterday, if you, if, and you remember the date on the side to show when it had been promulgated. If you use a form that uh, an old form they got uh, re-promulgated, uh, yeah, you can lose your license. You can get suspended or a complete revocation. That's so, something fun we're gonna have to deal with the next class and the next section for promulgated forms is uh, all these slides. This is from 2017. Uh, they just redid the one before family residential contract, which is the one we use 95% of the time. They just redid that form. Uh, April 1st of this year. And they so added, a, in, a whole they added in whole new paragraphs, took out other paragraphs and whatever. So we're going to go through the slides and I'm going to pull up the form and go, this is why that's not that anymore. This is why this is also different. So, <laughs> they all go so, into very in, into detail. With yeah. That. Um, but they do like to change contracts, yeah. but you yourself cannot change the contract. Um, so yeah, if it has an acceleration clause in there, and you don't pay for three months, they might, they may just say, hey, we're sending you an acceleration clause, pay it now, or the fourth works, which if you owe 200,000, you're probably not gonna pay 200,000 outright. If you miss the three months, you think you're gonna pay the, you think you're gonna pay the rest? If you nope. can, I'd give it up. Here's the rest of it. You could have washed, <laughs> you could have washed the job or something in the middle of the or something like that. And then, uh, but it's just another way for them to get their property back. Questions? Assignment of a mortgage. Now, that's when a mortgage can be sold without changing provisions. That's like uh, someone say, uh, I, they, some people they'll, how do I say this? They'll see that a house is about to be foreclosed on, so they'll come up to the uh, to the person that owns the house and say, hey, I'll pay 150000 for your $250,000 house because it's going to be foreclosed on. And I'll assume the debt. And I'll assume all of that. So it's basically just giving away your interest to another person um, without changing any of the provisions of the original agreement. So I mean, you can do that. You, you think that guy's doing it out of the kindness of his heart? No, he needs to make some money. So he's probably going to pay on that and then turn it around and sell it for more um, so yeah you can you can give your interest to another party without changing the contract and that would become a trustee that would become a or they would actually have there would be, there, no, 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 no. What? the person i don't want to sell the person who's paying off the loan someday. no no like if, if someone came in and assumed your loan for your house that was getting full photos on. Justin, do you know? What was that? Just sit back here and not answer. I'm going to ask a complicated question. That's good. I'm like, yeah, she's asking some questions. I'm like, I'm liking the flounder. I'm teaching them. He's enjoying our suffering. So. Yes. Especially they've got to learn how to deal with this. So, what was the question? Well, so she's asking if someone were to assume your mortgage. Huh? Would they be the trustee? Nope. They'd be the beneficiary. Yeah. Right? Nope. So if there's an assumption, it, it's going to be they basically are taking over your spot. 
So if you're the trust or say you're trustee or trustor, I assume your note, I'm taking over your spot because I'm now a borrower. So I'm just filling in because that's what I'm doing. So I'm assuming I'm a substitute. So I'm pulling in for your situation. Now, most of the time in assumption, it's going to be a novation where they're going to get rid of the whole loan and I'm going to have a brand new one from scratch. Does that make sense? But the key word you need to know is novation. Novation is where you're removing everything, you're starting from scratch. I think novation is a little further. Sometimes down. not, but he'll probably talk about that. But I was saying, you're doing yeah, I like this, but I think keep them in line. Keep them in line, Mr. Beaver. I don't like them. Keep them on their toes. Keep them on their toes. Yeah, I think we talk more about novation in a bit. And I was saying that when you're like the bank would sell your mortgage to another bank. That's, that's what I was saying when I was saying trustee. That's a benefit of yours. Um, so a release of a mortgage lien or trust or deed of trust um, is going to be by satisfaction, which means if you paid off your loan, which means you're going to get a release of deed and you will get title. Easy, easy to understand that. Just release the lien after it's paid. Taxes and insurance reserves. Uh, so taxes and insurance reserves are fund required by, by buyers, uh, by some lenders. They can impound or an escrow account. Um, so you're going to pay your taxes how many times a year? Twelve or twice. Twelve or twice. Wasn't it just one? I thought just. So it's business and business. Well, you're, you, you're asking what type of taxes. You gotta ask them that. Is it income? Is it property? Or what kind of your your? If it's escrow, then it would be twelve. But if you're paying at the tax office, it's twice. Twice a year. There you go. She got you. She knows more than I do. No, she, no, yo, she's probably got a house. I got a house. And she <laughs> understands. But yeah. I do all the living. <laughs> He that, so. so she oh, understood yeah. it. Well, she's been through it. Yeah, that's right. I do not own a house. First thing. So, no. I get it. It'll happen. But just take Wyatt's flat card. Oh, great idea. Great I, idea. I, Miss I, Vita, I, take his card and pay off your house, too, by the way. Oh, you got me? Yeah. <laughs> Even though one is 18% interest rate. <laughs> yeah, I get it. So, so, I'm, I'm going to get state rate. Oh, yeah, you're great. 18%. <laughs> I'm, I'm great. 18%. How about a, all right. Million dollar home. You got me on that. <laughs> I said I got you. I got you. <laughs> 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 Inside. In the greenhouse house that's Yeah. 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 Okay, another mortgage or deeds of trust. There's also a subject to our buying or assuming a seller's mortgage or deed of trust. Um, subject to the buyer takes the title, but are not personally obligated to pay the debt in full. So I can have title of your property, but the uh, the original person or the seller could still have or still has to pay the debt. The, um, the trust or the, the trustee does not pay. Um, there's also an assumption: buyer becomes personally obligated for the payment of the debt. Um, so the buyer's going to assume the debt in that situation. Um, if a novation is executed, the buyer is solely responsible for any default and seller is freed of all liability. And yeah, I think just let's talk about novations. Um, just one way to remember, remember that no invasion, novation, there's no longer a contract. So just, you know. No. So no basin just means it's no longer contract. I don't think so. I love them. I'm telling you, like people that drink a lot of water prefer them to. Oh, girl, I drink a lot of water, but it has to be quite cold. Mine's got to be ice cold. Nah. Mm -hmm. It's got to be cold. Mm -hmm. I can't do it. I'm going to have the fridge that's up on the counter for an hour. And then I'll drink it. Yeah, that's right for you. If I drink it, it he, Are you kidding? Or do you see? No, I seriously do that. Like, I'm at the house and I'm like, I'll, I'll grab a water bottle and like sit on the counter and then. Why do you put it in the fridge right now? Yeah. Why do you put it in the fridge? I don't. 
If it's up to me, they're just like sitting. Yeah, when like, you have somebody else's house, I'll yeah. just leave it out and let it. Or put it in hot water. My wife cannot have anything but cold water, so she'll put water in the fridge. And I usually have like, if we get like a big 36 pack or 24 pack of water, I'll put 10 of them in the fridge and I sleep the rest on the floor. Like, just in a, <laughs> in the thing. And I'll. This guy right here, if he's outside working all day, and I'll give him a cold water and I'll give it to him, he won't drink it because he says it's best to the table. <laughs> you say that? No, I say that. that? I say that? When did 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 I say that? When that's I bet true. he did say it, but just to mess with you. Yeah, probably. Water. Water. He's probably. Like, I can't do that. I'm out of here. I don't understand drinking room temperature water, but you do you. Okay. It don't. That's what I said. That's why I can't drink it. That's why. Because if it was cold, I probably would drink about that much. Um. <laughs> Uh, there's also an alienation clause which prevents future purchasers from being able to assume the loan. So, in other words, you buy the property, you can't even assume the loan. The original person has it, period. It's on the side. It has an alienation clause in there. It just means no one else can take that loan. Do you have a question? I'm confused. There you go. <laughs> Is it all the water thing? At least not that. <laughs> <laughs> Room temperature water. Room temperature water just enlightens me. Okay. So, alienation clause. Please don't tell because I'm like totally confused. Is that like if somebody were to assume the loan? So the say you were trying to sell. Owner won't allow you in. So say you're trying to sell your house, right? And you have a mortgage on there. Uh -huh. But the mortgage comes it has in there it has an alienation clause. That means when you sell your house, you're still going to be paying off that debt until it's done. You can't pass your interest to. <laughs> So is it more of a thing for the seller? What are you doing, man? You're just trying. <laughs> why, why are you looking at me? You're talking you to you. Why am I looking at you? You got a cup on your ear, bro. <laughs> What's it say right there? That the, what? Alienation <laughs> clause prevents future purchasers. purchasers. He was doing fine right before you distracted him. I don't know what happened. Welcome to the team. Welcome to the a teacher. This happens all the time. For, from being able to assume love, correct? Correct. So in that particular situation, what does that end up saying? That means that even if you sell your home, you're still going to be paying on it? That basically meaning that you cannot assume a loan. The chance that you have to assume a loan is very slim. That they're not going to allow it. So they're just not going to Basically, allow you'll have to pay off the rest of the mortgage, but you can't. I was, if I'm getting this right, this is something I'm trying to do one too, but basically if I'm selling my house, I owe $150,000 on it. I sell my house for three hundred thousand dollars. It doesn't work. If I sell my house, I can't just be like, "Cool, I only take this much, and you'll just take the rest of my loan that or the rest of my mortgage." Instead, it's you pay me the whole amount. I will pay off my mortgage, and you'll get your own mortgage. But I can't just pass off my loan to somebody else. That's what happens with that title, is where they like divide the money. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Well said. Is that cleared up? Yep. Right. Awesome. What? You said eight right right there. Can we kick him out of the class? Oh, I, I, I saw that move. I, I was like, I was a great move. I saw that. He was sneaky. He was like, what? I didn't he do that. Two thumbs up, come on his ear. I point at him and he's like, I didn't do no that. You're talking about Miss McKinnis, so I've been good back here. Yeah, so good. So not distracting. Man, I wish I was still in his classes. <laughs> I wish I still had you. Uh, so recording a mortgage or deed of trust must occur in the recording office or the county in which the property is. So if you if you live in Florida but you own a property in Texas, you're gonna have to come all the way down to Texas to uh, record to get to record the deed. You can't hire power attorney. I guess you could hire a power of attorney in that, Justin. Could you, right? Power of attorney can always be utilized for a deal, like if you wanted to pay that off. Like to be in that. You, you might not have to come down, but somebody would in that country. Somebody would. Yeah. So, 
Um, yeah, it's got to be in the county where it, the, the actual real estate is located, not where uh, y'all signed the deed or whatever. It's got to be in that county. And the priority of a mortgage or deed of trust is determined in the order in which they were recorded. So basically, first come, first serve. Uh, uh, so if you keep your first, you got priority. Makes sense. All right. Uh, provisions of land contracts and owner financing. Uh, so a buyer agrees to make a down payment and a monthly loan payment of interest, principal, possibly taxes and insurance. That's the PITI that we talked about. Principal, insurance, taxes, I mean, principal, interest, taxes, insurance. Um, and the seller retains legal title until the end of the loan term. Buyer is granted equitable title and possession, but they don't have legal title. Um, legal title is when you, you get that when you pay off the loan. Foreclosure, and this is what we were talking about earlier. Your house can be foreclosed on, probably because you didn't pay your, your mortgage or your promissory note. Uh, property pledged to security is sold to satisfy the debt. In other words, you owe us money, we're taking back the house and then we're going to sell it so we get our money back for the loan. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, there's a whole BPO system with foreclosures. Um, if you join up with us, you might enter into that for a while. It's a good way to say, make side money, but yeah. um, they just send you houses, say this is foreclosing, and then you have to take pictures. It doesn't of always have to be foreclosed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because you can just, you can go on the website and just order a BPO. So yeah. I've had some that are ordered by the owner of the house because maybe they're looking to sell their house, but they have no idea what it's worth. Yeah. And so they, they go on, we use Clear Capital a lot and stuff like that. And so they'll go on Clear Capital's website and say, hey, I'd like someone to do a BPO at this address, which is their own address. We go out, do this whole research, and go, I think it's about $325,000 with improvements, and do about three forty five. dollars And they go, cool. And then they know what to fit, what to sell their house yeah. basically. That's what a BPO is. It's a broker price opinion. So it's basically you, you take comparables in the area and determine the amount. So the house is actually a lot worse. It's, 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 I'd say it, it's like if we want to Brian, it takes me, I mean, I probably spend three minutes at the actual property and go like drive by it and record it on my phone as I drive by it, yeah. drive by the other way and record it on my phone as I drive by it. And then I go back and take screenshots just what happened on the front of the house and the side of the house. Whatever. So two to three minutes driving by the property and then it probably takes an hour on the computer, maybe. And like when you first start, it'll take about two and a half because you're trying to figure it all out. So probably like two and a half hours. But like now I can do one in about 30 minutes. Yeah, once so you know what you're doing, and, you can knock them out real quick. Yeah. So but when you first see it, you're gonna look at the form and be like, what in the world what, is this? That's yeah. what I did. When I first saw a BPO form, Justin, I was like, Justin, Hell. what is going on here? <laughs> what did you come but basically you'll find all what did you get me find, into? Whether it's on the MLS or the tax records or something like that, you'll find or the CAD, you'll find all the the I guess specifications of the house. So three bed, two bath this needs for feet, this whatever, this whatever. And you'll go on and fill that out, and then you'll find comps and just do the same thing where you'll pull out, well, this bed, this one's actually a four bed, three bath, so it's an extra bedroom, an extra bathroom. So because of that, I think it's actually, this house is worth this much more than the house they're selling. And you'll find like three that are, have just been sold and three that are active mm -hmm. on the market right now. And so you can kind of go through and it's, it's, there's, it's not hard. It's just yeah. almost, it, it, at, at the beginning, it's very tedious and kind of time consuming, but once you figure out how to do them, get right to it. So, yeah. And so, yeah, so foreclosure is just, it's, we, we need our money back because you didn't pay us. So, we're going to take the property back and sell it uh, to, satis to satisfy the debt. And there's a couple of methods you can do uh, foreclosures. Uh, there's a judicial foreclosure, and that allows the property to be sold by court order after sufficient notice to the mortgagor. Uh, sufficient notice, roughly about three days, I believe, correct, right, Justin? For sufficient notice? No. Sufficient notice and that situational foreclosure is at least 10 days following the Monday. 10 days following the Monday. 
Okay, so we have a certain amount of time to so let the mortgage or now and things will be here. Wyatt, I'm coming back now to pick on you again. When is a judicial foreclosure utilized? What type? We talked about this earlier. Is it? Is it going to judicial foreclosure is utilized in deed of trust or mortgage? You said mortgage. There you go. So what's the second one? What type of other one is that one? Non-judicial foreclosure. the deed of trust. There you go. You're catching on. Very good. Got it. Uh, and a non judicial foreclosure is there's no court order required uh, to sell the property. So, judicial just means that's actually court, non judicial. You know, you work in a law office, you probably know all that. Not really, but kind of. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know some, but, but, um, and yeah, non judicial is going to be no court. And there's also a strict foreclosure, and that's after notice to mortgage or the court establishes deadline for payment. If not paid, the court awards full legal title to the lender. So if you don't pay it, we get it back. We get our money back somehow, right? And then the last one, there's also one uh, deed in lieu of foreclosure. It's it's a friendly, a sort of friendly foreclosure. It's like you know you're gonna get foreclosed upon. So you just you just give them the house back basically. You're saying, okay, I'm getting foreclosed, here's the house back. I don't want it. And that's a method still? That's a method. To, yeah, that's a method to foreclose, yes. So a lot of times if my clients don't have a lot of money and they can't afford to move out of the house, I'll contact the bank and say, hey, Ms. Vita, my client, Ms. McKenna, cannot pay to pay you anymore. So instead of you spending thousands of dollars to hire attorneys and go through the whole process, mm -hmm. my client's more than willing to move out, but she needs about a thousand or so to move out of the property. Would you mind writing a check to Ms. McKenna, so she or a mover, say Wyatt? Would you write a check to Wyatt so that Wyatt can end up coming and getting her stuff, move her out? She'll sign a deed of lieu, deed of lieu, give you back ownership, and then you can sell it and not have to go through all that process. So, let's say you go and hire an attorney and spend thousands and thousands of dollars, you may pay Wyatt to make a thousand, two thousand bucks. She's out, you got the deal, you'll put it up for foreclosure. Whatever money you get, whatever's left over, you'll pay back to McKenna. If you don't get enough, you'll get a judgment against McKenna, and you'll go after him from that. Okay. So is it, is it, it's if you know you're going to get foreclosed on and you don't want to go through all that mess, it, this could save you from it. And that's one of the methods for uh, foreclosure. Uh, there's a, re a redemption period uh, for foreclosure. It's equitable right of redemption after default but before the foreclosure so after you default you haven't paid but before we actually start the foreclosure process uh, the borrower pays the amount in default to the lender and the debt is reinstated so you paid what you were that you didn't pay you paid what you owed and so you get the property back you have that redemption period uh statutory statutory right of redemption uh, it's where defaulted borrowers can redeem their real estate after the sale. And this is not something that we use in Texas. Um, so that's good if you're, trying, you know, if, you, if you're about to be foreclosed on, you got that redemption period. If you have the money, pay your stuff or, you know, go for a deed in lieu so you don't have to deal with all the other stuff. The sad thing is a lot of people will just move and run. And they'll vacate the property, which is the worst thing you can do. You know, ninety-nine percent of the time, call the lender, talk to the lender, and work it out. Yeah, it may not be something you want to deal with, but get it done. You see what I'm saying? What can it lead to if you don't? I mean, it's going to destroy your credit one way or another. But yeah. if you limit, like for example, where McKenna needs, she has no money to pay. Well, if I call Miss Vita and say, Miss Vita, hey, can we work something out, get all this done, get her out? You don't hire a bunch of attorneys to go, go incur court costs, don't incur all these other fees. Well, what we're doing is we're limiting the damage to McKenna once she sells the property. Because inevitably, in, inevitably, you're going to sell that property. So we want to keep expenses to close to nothing as possible. So you want to try to limit it so that when you do sell, there's not an excess that's owed. But that's not going to be like that. Correct. On the legal fees. Correct. So it's just always best to end up trying to get to them, but a lot of people are so embarrassed they don't want to talk about it. And then by the time they do talk about it, it's so far gone, it's 
do how much you can do. Uh, there's also a deed to purchase at sale. That's where a successful bidder receives the deed if there's no right of redemption. So if it's being bidded on, uh, there's no redemption, so you don't have the right to get the property back, you, you know, to where to go pay it. Uh, and so that the successful bidder will get the deed. Let that auction. Yep, and send an auction. Um, and after foreclosure, the mortgagee may have the right to a deficiency judgment against the borrower for an unpaid balance. So anything you didn't pay, they can get a, they can get a judgment on the floor. Avoid foreclosures. <laughs> you do not want a foreclosure, just pay. Unless you're buying it. Unless you're installing cement down toilet. Well, you should never put cement down the toilet. No, someone... okay, if you're going to buy one, oh, try to avoid that. Yeah. It's, sometimes with foreclosures, you can't actually look inside, right? Yeah, like tax sales and stuff, they won't come inside yeah, the property. Just, yeah. <clears throat> they just will, this, this property is just set up. Yeah, they'll be in the front yard. Yeah. yeah. Oh, do they ever let you know what the house is going to be before they put it up? What do you mean? Before they auction it or before they... You know, like, like, you can look up and see like, which ones are coming up. Like which ones will be at this the next round or whatever, and you can drive by them, but you're not going to go to the, like you probably won't go inside because they don't. So say I'm like crazy one right there, and I just happen to be in the neighborhood, and there's a window. Well, I'm not allowed to get legal. I can't. I can't. Yeah. As a as a real estate agent, I'm not allowed to. Get my my legal lawyer counsel. is telling me I shouldn't say anything. Yeah, so. I was gonna have to. Have to ask an attorney about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go to an attorney for that one. Say that again. I don't want to hear that question. What? Say that again. I don't want to hear. What was her question? <laughs> She's talking about the money. I'll let her ask it because I don't remember. It's <laughs> so long. Good night, much. It's so long. I don't remember. It's so long. I don't remember. So that's the house. Hours. And okay, so you're looking at the house on the website. You find out what the address is before they put it up for auction. You can't look at the inside. You want to make sure that it is decent. If I can come to you at the night. If Waterbury just happens to be in the neighborhood and there's a window open, dot 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 dot. Talk to an attorney about that. Or just simply talk. What are you? <laughs> Easier said than done, though. I will say, as a real estate agent, I'm not allowed to give legal comment. Just send somebody else to the dirty work. Simple as that. You just like somebody else. You are you. You just need to just the same thing. I got an alibi. Just is like, I'm not even touching that one. No, I mean, I'll take my staff and I go into a house that is vacant, but also in foreclosure. And my thing is, if you have to go to the restroom, you have to go to the restroom. Mm -hmm. Good call. Let's go find out. You gotta make sure that that toilet does not have to rent. That's right. That's right. Sam, that's a good way to find out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, you, you probably won't know what you're buying in one of those auctions. Uh, the outside of a house can be very misleading, I will say. Sometimes the outside of the house can be beautiful. And then inside they were doing satanic rituals. <laughs> and inside they were doing satanic rituals and it's a mess in there. Yep. Um, right, so yeah, they can, they can uh, if you don't pay, they, yeah, they'll get a judgment against you for unpaid balance. Uh, real estate financing market. Okay, the Federal Reserve System, the Fed. Federal Reserve, yes. Uh, it consists of 12 Federal Reserve District banks. We won't go into too much detail on this. You don't really need this. Not, it's not going to be on the test. Um, but it regulates the flow of money and interest rates in the marketplace. So they're just re regulating prices and blah, blah, blah. All that. Um, so that's your beautiful Federal Reserve, regulating the money. Uh, so there's a, there's two different markets. There's a primary and a secondary mortgage market. We go into secondary. Yeah. Uh, so the primary mortgage market that consists of lenders that earn income from the finance charges collected at loan closing including loan or origination fees, like I talked about earlier. Sometimes you have to pay for just even getting a loan. And discount points. Um, 
they also earn income from a reoccurring income, like interest collected during the term of the loan. So they have constant income coming in because they're getting interest. Uh, funds generated by sale of loans on the secondary mortgage will market. Um, so the funds that they acquire from the primary mortgage market, they're going to use in the secondary mortgage market, which we'll go into a little more about the secondary mortgage market and don't go into great detail uh, in finance in that class. Um, and they also get money from fees, loan servicing other mortgage lenders or investors who have purchased the loans. So fees for the loan servicing, um, other mortgage lenders or investors who might purchase the loan from them. And that's the secondary market. Uh, which we go into a minute. We sort of more on primary, uh, but there's two. There's two market: primary and secondary. Uh, primary is going to be the main market. That's going to be where you're going to get your uh, your mortgages. Uh, there's lenders. There's fiduciary lenders, thrift savings associations, commercial banks, credit unions, mortgage banking companies, mortgage brokers. Those are all going to be. Uh, primary market, um, what do you call it, primary market, supplier, yeah, yeah. So those are what's going to be in the primary market. Now the secondary market, this is where loans are bought and sold after being funded. So you can buy them like a lot of times lenders will buy from other lenders to say I'll buy your more, I'll buy this mortgage. Um, so that, that's the secondary market is where you're going to buy something that's already been funded. Uh, like I said, the primary is going to be where, where we get our mortgages and everything. The secondary is mostly for banks and lenders and stuff like that. Sounds like monopoly. It's kind of, yeah, a little bit. No, but it, uh, it provides additional income to lenders to make more loans, with lenders often retaining servicing functions or fee. So they can charge you a fee, even if they like you buy the loan from them, they'll charge you a fee for that. It gives them more money to then turn and make more, yeah. more of loans. Uh, purchase purchases mortgage loans through agencies, assembles uh, them into packages called pools, and sells them as securities. So it's primary is where we get our mortgages, secondary is where they're Mortgages aren't even paid, but they're they're basically rotating other lenders and everyone else is buying it. What? What? Oh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we'll go into more detail on that on finance as well. But um, Fannie Mae creates mortgage-backed securities using full of conventional FHA and VA loans. Um, you may see Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, all that on the test. I would maybe do some vocabulary just to know what they are and what they do. Uh, I, I think I saw most of them on the test. I, I, think I, I still don't know how to keep going for it. Same here. So I just, I just told myself that if I just know all the other questions, you know, I only have to get like a 70 or whatever. Then I still pass. I can miss those. I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually. Oh yeah. I got confused on this part as well. I have one question where all the answers were just the different. The different thing. It's pretty back and I was like, who knows? So well. B. Move on. Can there be a beat on this? Money. Okay. Can you put a beat a Mac? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Or a beat a May? Yeah. Uh, so Freddie Mac purchases mortgages. Oh. Pools, like you said, when all of them have come together as a pool, and sells as securities on the open market. So they'll take it and they'll resell it on the actual civilian market, the primary market. Jing May, Farmer Mac, Federal Home Loan Banks, do more in the secondary market. Uh, Jenny May is a division of the Department of Housing and Urban Development, which is HUD, and administers special assistance programs and guarantees mortgage-backed securities based on FHA and VHA loans. It's basically a uh, 
an assisting program for getting you into the house. Uh, the Federal Home Loan Bank, they purchase loans from member banks. So they, they just purchase loans from banks. Uh, Farmer Mac purchases agriculture related loans. That was the one that I actually remember because it's farmer. Yeah. Pretty easy to run that one, but the other ones, I, I was on Travis and Boat. I, I got confused too, but they you will likely see these on the test, so just be aware of it. Uh, financing techniques, straight loan or a term loan or interest only loan. Those are just different words for the same thing. Uh, periodic payments of interest only for the life of the loan. Uh, with payment of principal, principal in full at the end. So the whole time you're paying that loan, you're not paying any of the principal. You're not paying any of the of what you actually borrowed. You're only paying the interest. And then at the end of the term, you're like, hey, you owe us this much money. You paid all your interest, but now you're a principal. So not a great idea, but it is, it is there. <laughs> Um, interest only mortgage is another financing technique. Uh, that requires the payment of interest only for a stated period uh, with the principal balance, principal balance due at the end of the term. So you pay interest for a certain set period and then you start paying principal. Yeah, at the end of the loan, you're still going to owe most of the principal at that point because you've been paying insurance interest. A balloon payment. Well, this is an interesting one, isn't it, Justin? It's a partially amortized loan. There's periodic payments of interest and principal, not great enough to pay down in time. Is that word correct? Yeah. Not great enough to pay down entire amount borrowed by the end of the long term resulting in a larger final payment. So basically, uh, your final payment is pretty much going to be the entire loan. I feel like that's kind of awesome. You're going to do a payment? Well, it's really weird. It's not, it's not an arm. So it's like for the first 10 years, I'm locked in an interest rate. And then at the end of those 10 years, if I don't refund it, then I'm going to be aware that that final payment is going to be going to be big. Yeah, I looked at the contract and I was like, what are these numbers? I don't like those numbers. <laughs> Too many numbers. They're don't worry about that. Just refund for 10 years. Um, I do remember seeing balloon payment on the test as well. Just be aware of it. You may see it. Um, but it's nothing you ever actually want to do. There are situations I have a client right now I'm dealing with who his wife is a full time practicing doctor, um, but she just actually bought her own practice. And so they can't get a loan right now for two years because now they're self employed technically, so they don't have a W 2. And so banks aren't willing to give them a loan, even though they have plenty of assets, their credit score is fantastic. It's just they just won't let them do it. So we were talking to a couple lenders that we know, and they were all like, I really want to, but like, I just can't. Like the, the banks just won't do it. So I just can't do it for like two years until they give me enough kind of like I get that background of the oh, W2s they and the, just they it. just opened oh, it like wow. a few months ago. And mm -hmm. so that's kind of the problem they're in right now. But so what we ended up doing was we found somebody who's willing to do a uh like personal equity kind of like you know, their own private investor to sort of buy this thing. And so we're kind of planning on them getting into like a balloon payment style loan for like five years and just after two or three years for like a 30 year loan, but it's after two or three years refinancing to do a conventional loan with, it, right. with a conventional like bank and yeah. do the because they'll have the ability to at that point. Yeah. But what that'll do also is it'll make those first two years a little bit lower because your initial payments are always low and they just build up yeah. and then the last one's gigantic. So that for those first three years or however long they're gonna be in it. It'll be lower, and then they can refinance at a better interest rate and everything like 
that. So, right. And they're, they're trying to get into this right here, fully amortized. Yeah. Well. And they're trying to get into something like that, but they just, they're in a weird position right now where it's just kind of a weird situation of, they have all the stuff, they just can't do it. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so there's, like I said, these ones, there is situations where those would be useful. It's true. Um, but generally, this is what you want right here, a fully amortized loan. It's going to be equal periodic payments of interest and principal, so you're paying off both, um, resulting in a complete payment of amount borrowed over the term of the loan. So when you're done with the loan, you paid it off. You own the house now. And if you want to check out the wall, like I was talking about earlier, you can. You don't have to talk to a lender. Just do it. Yeah, the reason I got into the loan that I did is because the interest rate is a lot lower with that one. Yeah, yeah. People will do that just to get the smaller interest rate until they're able to refinance and get a better deal. Right, exactly. Uh, interest rates were low for a while because of COVID this year, but they're starting to go back up. Uh, I think a few last month they jumped several points. Like it was, it was one guy, uh, one of my clients was locked in for like three, and then like within two days it went up to like three point eight. Yeah, I think I saw it until it was 2.3. 2.3? Yeah, because it was a yeah. That's so a good interest rate. Yeah. That's a very good interest rate. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's what you want when you're when you're doing that. You want a fully amortized loan. Because you don't have to worry about a giant payment at the end of the loan. It's also an adjusted adjustable rate mortgage or an ARM. You might see it written as ARM mm -hmm. on the test. They like to use their little acronyms. Uh, it's lower initial rate of interest than may be charged over the life of the loan based on a specific index, uh, usually tied to the U.S. Treasury securities. So your interest rate may be low at the term of the loan, um, but it's based on it's based on the laws of Texas or the U.S. Treasury. And that that. Adjustable rate mortgages can be good and they can be bad because um, you know your, your your rate could just go up, could just go down. You never know what it's going to do. Depends on the economy. Depends the economy on is the, good, the interest will be high. Mm -hmm. and the economy is bad, the interest will be low. Exactly. Uh, so that's another financing technique. And there's also a reverse mortgage. Uh, reverse mortgage payments made by the lender to the borrower. <laughs> At regular intervals, such as like less, less, such as a monthly in a lump sum, or as a line of credit to be drawn against, it allows the buyer to remain in the home, I mean the borrower to remain in the home, while also receiving income. Usually older people do that. Yeah, this this tendly, uh, tends to be the older people that they'll do a reverse mortgage. Yeah. Uh, more financing techniques. Uh, a purchase money mortgage is a note and a mortgage created at the time of purchase. Uh, the package loan includes all personal property and appliances as well as real estate. A construction loan finance construction of property improvements. So those are just other ways you can finance. So you get construction done, you're going to get a construction loan, and they'll finance for the improvements. Uh, a buy down uh, that's a payment that's made at closing to reduce the interest rate on the loan. And home equity loan is a home equity line of credit or key lock. You might see that on the test as well. Uh, it's junior to the original lien. So you have an original lien that's going to take precedence over the home equity loan. Very good question. Why is it key lock whenever where the OC comes from? Home equity line of credit. They put the O. They, oh, I was reading. I wasn't reading in parentheses. <laughs> it's been a long day. <laughs> it's been a long day. I know that's right. It feels like a Monday on the beach. Though. Oh, yeah. That's it what it feels Monday. like. It's definitely Monday, right? Is it Monday? It's yeah. Tuesday. It's Tuesday. What? Yeah. Uh, so there's a loan program. Friday, yeah. I'm telling you. It ain't Friday yet. 
My yeah. birthday is this month, and I can't wait till I get here. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you, girl. I'm going to you. You already know? Mm -hmm. yeah. Take care of that. Uh, <laughs> take care of take, uh, yeah. take Wyatt's black card. Take the card shopping. I'll have to. I'll have to. I earned it. <laughs> um, so a conventional loan, these are the different loan programs. A conventional loan is the most secure loan. That's what you want, conventional loan. Uh, the loan to value ratio, ratio or LTV is often lowest for these loans, traditionally 80%, meaning that you only have to pay 20% down uh, to get the loan. Uh, so yeah, conventional is the most secure. Remember conventional loan, most secure. You would think it would not be because it's just it conventional, or not conventional, but it's the most secure loan. Uh, more on conventional loans. We got left. We got a little bit to go. Uh, conventional loans, they meet all the requirements of the secondary market set by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac um, for conforming loads. No, it includes the following. Uh, the borrower's monthly housing expenses include PITI, principal interest taxes, and insurance. And it should be no more than 28% of the monthly gross income. Now, the borrower's monthly total monthly obligations include housing costs and other regular monthly payments must not exceed 30% of the total monthly gross income. <clears throat> so they have a certain set amount that they, they can't charge over for that. Um, but yeah, the regular monthly payments should be, you know, Maintenance on the house, your mortgage payment, all that stuff. Private mortgage insurance, PMI. I'm sure Justin has a lot to say about this one. Uh, it's required for LTVs higher than 80% and down payments of less than 20%. So you can pay a lower down payment, but the loan to value ratio is higher. FHA insured loans. Justin, should I go into more detail about PMI? I mean, they mainly just need to know what PMI is and what type of loan it relates to. So, yes. Yeah. I would say just know that what it stands for and that it takes for LTV is higher than 80. Okay, yeah. yeah. Does that make sense to everybody? It's a good way to loan to value ratio. Yeah. FHA insured loans. Uh, the requirements for that is the borrower must pay a down payment of at least 3.5% of the purchase price, which is the normal uh, as you pay 3.5%. The borrower is charged a mortgage insurance premium, an MIP, and the mortgage real estate must be appraised by the approved FHA. Approved. They're going to have their own person that they want to go out there, it's FHA approved. Parentheses uh, to appraise the house because they want to know the value because they're going to the market. Remember, I said if you get it, you get loaned, they're going to want it. They're going to want an appraisal, but they want to know what the place is worth. <clears throat> uh, the FHJ sets maximum mortgage limits for various regions of the country. Uh, certain areas may have a higher than, low, uh, than others. Uh, the borrower must meet standard FHA credit qualifications. There is a, a set of qualifications that you have to meet to qualify for an FHA loan. It's basically a government loan. It's, it's, it's a government loan. A VA loan, that's a veteran's loan. Our guaranteed loans are backed by the Department of Veteran Affairs and are available to eligible veterans and spouses. So even if the spouse's husband were to die overseas or something, she's still entitled to uh, a VA loan because she's married to a veteran. Uh, agricultural loans, the Rural Housing Service, RHS, is part of the Department of Agriculture. Uh, and has programs to help families purchase or operate family farms. So there's, there's different programs out there that you can get in 
if you qualify uh, to help you and your family run a farm or if you're a VA, if you're a veteran. Um, and remember for a VA, you can only have one active VA loan at a time. So um, if, you're, if you're a veteran, you can only have one active but you can always sell a VA loan, so if they need to sell your house, you can get another VA loan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, except you can only have one active, so if you sell one, you have one available spot, you get another one. And that's generally what they do. I haven't dealt with any VA loans myself. They're a little different uh, as far as being the agent in that kind of transaction. They're a little different. Um, we have someone that's trained or knows VA loans, it, it's a whole different deal. Um, but yeah, they can only have one active at a time. So they sell the property, then you go do another VA loan. And they're a lot more, a lot more straight. Yeah, and for a VA loan, how much do you have to put down to do it? What's the down payment? 70%. 70%. Wow. 70%. Wow. <laughs> so if you're a VA, you can buy a house. Zero money's down. We respect our seventy percent down. Right off the bat, we need hundred percent down. Hey, give us all the money. No, it is zero. What? I say it is zero. Yeah, zero. Uh, the Truth in Lending Act and Regulation Z that re uh, requires that a loan is secured by a residence. Lenders inform borrowers of the true cost of obtaining credit uh, within the following rules. Uh, advertising is strictly regulated, and there's a $10,000 penalty for each day the violation continues. So, you, you're violating the truth in lending, you try and you know, say, pull one over on someone, give extra higher insurance or something like that, um, then you're breaking the truth in lending act and regulation Z, and you can be charged criminal. Um, yeah, so every day that it keeps going, you're only ten thousand more dollars, and that is not cheap. <laughs> ten thousand, a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, the Equal Credit Oppor Opportunity Act. I believe have we covered this in this class? I don't think we have actually. No, we'll cover it in a bunch of other classes. Yeah, you'll, you'll see yeah. it multiple times in the other classes as well. Uh, it just it prohibits discrimination on granting or arranging credit basis of race, color, religion, national origin, uh, sex, marital status, age, as long as the applicant is not a minor age, or dependence on public assistance. So it doesn't matter who they are, what race they are, where they're from, their age, you cannot uh, discriminate. And basically, that stops me from going Okay, well, in order to get this loan, you know, we'd like for you to be the 700 credit score step in because, you know, whatever. Oh, Ms. Vito, we actually need you to be at a 750 in order to qualify. But you can't, that's kind of what I'm saying, you can't discriminate in the branching or arranging of the credit. So I can't make it where Y has to have a better credit score because he's married and he has a kid. So I need his credit to be better than him because right. he's single. Or we'll be able to around for that. <laughs> And there are predatory lending people out there. Yeah. So if, you know, if they know you don't have money, they try and loan to you, and then you're going to be in debt forever. Pretty much. Uh, so this act was created to uh, reduce that. Uh, the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act, or RESPA, you may see RESPA uh, on your test as well. Uh, it ensures that buyers and sellers are fully informed of all costs of the settlement. You'll probably see both of them. Probably. Opportunity to get uh, so it just ensures that they know what they're going to pay, what the costs are. So we're lending and stuff like that. And in practice for I think, real estate, what we'll get is right before a, uh, uh, you know, within, I think it's three days, it has to be three days, yeah, for the closing day. Yep. So three days prior to, prior to your closing date. So if I have a closing this Friday, by today, or today, yeah, by today I should receive a closing disclosure. That'll be a breakdown. If I have clients that are buying a property, it'll be a breakdown of 
everything they owe and why they owe what, what these numbers are. So I was going to say, we'll bring bring like I have a closing on Friday that I got a in court day that the closing total is ninety five thousand dollars. So ninety five one eighty six or whatever. But it doesn't just say you owe us ninety five one eighty six. It says you owe us ninety five one eighty six because this much is the loan, this yeah. much is this closing cost, this much is for the survey they did, this much is for this one. Twenty-five dollar fee for this. Like, they'll break down it. It's like pages and pages of stuff. Like and that's what the, yeah. the, the, the act is for. Yeah. It's just so you know exactly. And you see both sides. So you see, see how much you're getting and how much the seller's going to get and how much they're paying for this stuff. And how you don't you mind pull it up in uh, contract forms yeah. or something, right. but yeah, it's going to say buyer seller credit debit credit debit. So this is what you owe. This is what you're credited. You know, it, it basically just lines out so you know exactly where your money's going. Can you read the people that are that are talking about the breakdown is. I have I've had no like I had a closing two months ago, I guess it was now, that uh they didn't they they were informed, I don't think they remembered that they were paying to have a certain thing. There was a telephone pole that was being put up on their property because it was like a bunch of tracks that were being split up or whatever, and it got moved. Um but then instead of it getting moved, they realized that they could just take it out and wire the other two poles together. They were still within a short enough distance. They had to go from A to B to C, and they realized that they removed this one, they could just do that. They didn't realize, they thought since they weren't moving it somewhere, they didn't have to pay the fee. It was like a $700 like relocation fee for that post. Um, but they were just removing it, not re relocating it. So they thought they didn't have to pay, which I think we talked about at some point, and I think they just kind of got confused and they didn't have to pay that. So when they were looking through the disclosure, that's something they brought up to me. It was like, I thought that wasn't this. And so we called title and kind of went through everything again and clarified. And we called the seller, the selling agent, kind of clarified everything again. But it's something that they caught on that disclosure that they need to be informed of, or else they would just have been told to bring this much to closing and they just would have done it. Yeah. And, and they now know. they know exactly what they're paying for. So. Right. They wouldn't have known what they were actually paying. Yeah. Um, I myself hasn't haven't had that happen uh, yet, but it's really that's why that's why they send it to you three days in advance, so you can dispute or say, hey, this is wrong, this is wrong, it should go like this. Um, so that act just is just to ensure that the buyers know what they're buying and selling. Yeah. 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 Computerized loan or origination (CLO). Uh, it's an electronic network for handling loan applications. Uh, reduces approval time because it has automatic underwriting that will reduce the amount of time it takes to get approval. Uh, programs can include Fannie Mae's desktop underwriter and Freddie Mac's loan prospector. And credit scoring has become an important part of loan application evaluation process. That's a big one. Credit scoring is huge. When it comes to evaluating um, for a loan, and it's getting bigger and bigger. Uh, so, computerized loan order origination is an electronic network for handling loan applications. <clears throat> and, Um, it's an electronic network for handling loan from I already went over that. Um, credit scoring has become an important part. Yep, but I guess that's it. I guess that's the end of our content for this evening. We got out a little bit early. Um, I'm surprised actually. I thought it was going to be way longer. Yeah, 40 something slides compared to yesterday's 12. Um, but thank you guys. We'll see you all tomorrow and y'all have a good night. Bye.